Hey everybody and welcome to Let's Look at Dungeon of the Endless. This is, you might be noticing a lot of games with Endless in the title lately or over the past few years. Endless Space, Endless Legend, Dungeon and the Endless, all three of these are from the same company. They just released Endless Legend like a month and a half ago. Uh, Endless Space was a couple years ago. Endless Space was a Space 4X game, kind of like a Gaussiv. Endless Legend was a more sword and sorcery type 4X game, a little bit like a fantasy version of Shiv or Warlock, Master of the Arcane or something like that. Dungeon of the Endless is very much more my jam. It's a little strategy dungeon crawler roguelike meets tower defense thing, but it's got its own unique take on the genre and definitely doesn't just feel like, hey, you know, roguelikes are big, we're making a roguelike. This has its own kind of unique thing going on. Very interesting presentation and I know that it's, you know, November, what, like 11th today. And, uh, 12th, I guess, if you're watching this video, and everyone's gonna be like, Rebirth, 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 Rebirth is great! I'm not trying to say that, you know, Rebirth is not great or anything like that, but there's, are, there is still room for other games to exist, and Dungeon of the Endless, uh, in that same kind of sphere as Rebirth, but a much more patient, kind of, you know, slow-paced, deliberate, uh, type of game, uh, is really, really good, and I would hate to see it get overlooked just because of the fact that it had maybe a little bit of unfortunate timing of release and came out uh, next to maybe one of the biggest roguelike-ish games of all time. In any case, I've played about two hours of this so far. I've watched Kate play like three hours. She is straight up addicted to this game. Uh, it's 13 bucks Canadian on Steam. I don't know what it is in the US. That probably comes out to like $12 maybe. We're gonna start up a new game here. So the premise of Dungeon of the Endless is that you are on a, uh, a spaceship, basically a penal transport. <laughs> Yeah, okay, let's get it out of the way. Uh, but it's getting shot down, and basically it crashes on uh, this moon, basically, and you're shooting out of an escape pod. So you start out, and you take two characters with you. Uh, by the way, the only difficulty I have right now is too easy and easy. Straight up, too easy is too easy. I, I played for about 45 minutes on it. You don't end up with the same kind of scarcity and having to make difficult decisions and deal with the repercussions that you do uh, on easy. Easy is difficult, though. You can think of this almost like FTL, a game that shares a lot of similarities with, um, it, it, especially the music. Uh, it's got like a really nice ambient kind of like Aphex Twin thing going on. But easy is not easy easy. It's it's normal <laughs> for the purposes of our game. You can unlock more difficulty uh, modes as you win, but winning is very difficult. So we've got a few characters to choose from here. Uh, you can unlock some more of them by uh, basically finding them in the environment. You'll you'll come into dungeons, basically, your different floors of the dungeon, where you'll meet other characters that you can purchase or hire for your team, and if you have them for X number of floors, you can unlock them. But I'm gonna stick with a very simple layout, which is just these two right here. So we've got Max O'Kane and Sora Numis. These are uh, default characters. These are some of the ones that I've unlocked. Um, we can, you know, read their bios. Max is eternally optimistic, mostly because he is too terrified of where he is to think about it seriously. He will always be looking to profit from a situation, get extra loot, take one more object, spend less money, etc. Even if it puts him in a bad, risky position, or earns angry comments from his heroes. He's an opportunist. We also have a bounty hunter. I guess that's not really like something that defines their characteristics, or defines their traits, but it defines their, uh, their character. You can also see some stats here, like their speed, which is important, uh, their attack power. I'm not sure what purple is, is it? Oh, uh, it's like wit, basically. The size of bonus provided by your hero when manipulating or repairing a module. Anyway, um, we're gonna head down to the next, or we're gonna start up the game here. You can only take two with you. When we get started, you will see what's up. Uh, admittedly, I've never actually seen this cutscene here, but it's got kind of like a pool uh, apogee. Is that how you pronounce it? I don't think I've ever pronounced it in real life. Um, kind of uh, pixelated look to it. And one of the things that's a trademark about these Endless games is that they've got this very unique visual style and Endless Legend is a, a very, very good looking game. Uh, especially when it comes to like lighting effects and stuff like that. Uh, and also it's got like a Gods Will Be Watching style, like pixel style that I think is cool. Anyway, it's a bit of a complicated game to talk about and one of the things that I've seen people not complain about but express some hesitance about when they look at a game like uh, Dungeon of the Endless is that it looks too complex. But it's really not that complex. There's just a lot of kind of interlocking systems. So, uh, the one system is turn-based dungeon crawling. Uh, like FTL, you know in FTL you start as your spaceship and you jump from uh, beacon to beacon. Basically that's the same thing that's working here, just in a different kind of conceit. Um, instead of jumping beacon to beacon, those turns are separated by doors. So even though the game takes place in real time, there are discrete steps that you take to progress. So we uh, control our characters almost the same way you would control them in XCOM. Uh, or not XCOM, sorry. Well, sort of XCOM, but I was thinking FTL. Um, they fight by themselves once you bring them into a room. Uh, the same way, you know, if you had uh, crew in FTL, they would fight enemies that boarded on their ship. So yeah, that, that constitutes one turn. What takes place on a turn? Well, if there is a room that is dark that you've discovered, enemy waves have a chance to spawn there. That's why it says down here, hostile creatures are found again. How do you stop hostile creatures from spawning? 
If you use your middle mouse button, you can light up the room. Uh, that uses some of your dust. It doesn't actually spend the dust, but think of dust almost like, um, like power, basically. You can divert the power. You don't really spend it, because, you know, it, it's still there if you stop using it. Like, we can turn it off and turn it on, and it doesn't cost us any dust here. Uh, these elements are, are common, by the way, a common thread that runs through all of the Endless games, at least from the little bit of Endless Legend I've played. I've, I've probably played, like, four hours, and I was gonna do a Let's Look at it that game, and I was like, it's just a little bit too complex for me. But in any case, yeah, you light it up. Okay. Light it up, enemies don't spawn here anymore. Uh, the other thing that happens on every turn is that you have, like, a 4x style uh, resource gain. So you have three resources, industry, science, and food. Industry allows you to build more things, which is important, because we do have, like, a little bit of uh, tower defense -y type stuff going on here, base building, sort of. Science allows you to research things when you come across a science crystal. And food allows you to uh, either heal your characters real-time, just by clicking this button if they get hurt, but they do get healed at the end of every turn, or every phase, I guess. Uh, and it also allows you to level up, so if we click on our character here, there are some RPG mechanics going on, like you can get some equipment, but the equipment is very simplified, which I think is good. Uh, it, it's not like a huge character sheet type of thing, like Dungeons of Dreadmore or something like that, not to say that Dungeons of Dreadmore is bad, but anyway. Um, with 25 food, we can level up, and that'll give us access to our active skills, I guess, although we already have active skill for her. Run away gives her just better speed. So now that we've opened up this room, one thing we might want to do is build some uh, creators. Now, creators allow us to get more resource gain per turn. By the way, this is going to start moving a lot faster, I promise. Uh, industry is what we use to make these modules, whether food, science, or industry. So I'm going to start by making an industry generator first, uh, so that we can build more generators in the future. These little modules on the ground, like these little spots here, we can build turrets there. Uh, as of right now, we only have Prisoner prisoner Prod 1, which basically is just a small little laser turret, but it will do damage to enemies, but we wouldn't expect any enemies to spawn, because all of our rooms are lit up right now. So what we, our goal, by the way, is to uh, get to the end of the floor and then take the elevator down to the next floor. There's 12 floors in the game. When we find the elevator, we have to pick up the crystal and take it to the exit, and that'll spawn enemies in all of the dark rooms that we have. Uh, so it creates this kind of like panicky situation at the end that's really fun. But for now, let's just do a little bit more exploring. So we will um, check out this new area here. This is a dead end, but we'll still want to keep this lit up if possible. We get a little bit of dust sometimes by finding um, basically just rooms that are full of dust. I'll light up this room so that we uh, don't have to deal with any enemies in there. And there's no reason not to light it up because we still have one more uh, room of capacity before our dust is out. I, I believe it costs 10 dust to fill up every room. So with 35, we can fill up three rooms. On this room, um, uh, generally speaking, by the way, you get one dust for killing each enemy. Or I think there's like a probability to get one dust for killing each enemy. See how they heal at the end of each room here? We're at 36 dust. Uh, and you can see our resource gain is now growing uh, for industry. For food and uh, science, it won't grow yet. Okay, we can't level up yet. Um, for food and science, it won't grow yet until we build more uh, modules. And you can only build them. See, we got dust for walking into this room. Um, you can only build uh, dust. Or sorry, you can only build uh, modules on areas where uh, there is like a major kind of, I don't even know what you would call this, like a slot to build them. Uh, so right now, we've encountered our first situation where we have more rooms than we have active dust able to actually light things up. So now we have to start prioritizing, and this is where you really get into the, I love this zoomed out map by the way, that's another common trend in, in Endless Legend, the map looks so sexy when you zoom out. I wish I'd actually invested a little bit more time into it, but um, we have to decide what rooms we want to light up. You have to have, uh, well, what were rooms we want to power, because light up sounds superficial, but, no, we need to, like, power this room, uh, because if we don't power it, the module won't actually work. So, I think we're going to depower this room, and power up this room, and, uh, we should be able to build something. Let's build a, uh, let's build a science creator, so that if we find our science crystal, we can start doing more research quickly. So, this will give us more science gain per turn, but now we have an issue. Because, uh, this area right here is gonna have a chance to spawn enemies, and those enemies will rush down for our crystal. We can't build, uh, a prisoner prod, because it costs a little bit too much industry. So what I'm gonna do is, uh, recognize that in opening this door here, we may spawn enemies in this dark area over here, almost as if it's Minecraft or something. And it'll give us, like, a little warning indicator if the enemies do get spawned and they kind of like cross over. So some enemies, uh, they have different properties by the way. Some enemies ignore you and go straight for the uh, modules. Some enemies ignore you and go straight for your crystal, which is kind of like your tower defense, you like ancient final objective. Uh, and some enemies will attack your heroes and ignore everything else. So we still don't have enough dust to power up uh, either of these actually, so we're in a bit of a weird spot. 
My suggestion is that we're gonna start building some tower defensey stuff here. And what these prisoner prods will do, by the way, we can use shift click just to speed up the building here, but that's me being an idiot. Um, what these will do is if enemies spawn, they will auto target and shoot at them. And three of them should be enough to take down these like relatively easy monsters, uh, you know, early ish in the game. So we can pause just like FTL and uh, kind of send our characters over here to open up another door. So yeah, it's got this cool kind of like real time possible uh, strategy going on. This, by the way, is a science crystal. There's uh, enemies that have spawned in here. Let's see if our turrets actually. Oh, they're gonna go straight for the heroes. Okay. Um, this is our science crystal. We'll wait till they're dead. Good. Um, we can click on the science crystal and start researching stuff. So we can research a new module. Tactical HUD gives us like, yeah, 18% attack power. So if we find a module, uh, we can build, or sorry, if we find a spot to build a module, we can build this, and then for the rest of the floor, we just get an absurd bonus to our attack power passively, which is really nice. But that means we won't be building another industry generator, or a food generator, or a science generator, etc., etc. Um, it's gonna take a few turns to do, like, new module, Kip Cannon. Knowledge is power. Attack power for each stock science is 0 0.8. Oh, that's interesting. Um, but I'm gonna go with, uh, suppressive fire. No, I'm gonna go with, uh, tear gas. We'll eventually start researching more and more of this stuff. And now we're, we're starting to deal with scarcity, because we don't have very much dust at all here. Uh, so we're going to have to uh, hopefully get more dust on this next level. Oh, we can level up, by the way. So let's do that. You can also get a, a preview of like passive skills that you can get for leveling up, by the way. And I think these might vary every single time, which is kind of neat. Right now, her passive skill is plus 10 defense when grouped with others they trust. And his passive skills are attack power plus 6% when mates are nearby, and uh, plus 2 science per turn. Alright, that's kind of nice. Every character has different kind of uh, abilities like this. Let's move up here. I'm not sure if you guys can hear the music too well, because I'm notoriously bad at uh, balancing kind of the audio levels that go on. Please let me get some dust here. I desperately would love to get some dust. If you lose a character, they're gone, by the way, so I'm gonna use some food uh, just to heal this guy up a little bit, because otherwise it's a pretty good chance that he would die. We could play this uh, a little differently strategically, like we could send our, um, our wounded hero back here. Oh man, we're gonna send both heroes back here, actually. Um, and my hope is that the uh, prisoner prod will give them a pretty good chance to actually survive this wave, because the enemies will be taking passive damage, like, a lot more quickly. I'm watching their health bars, getting... A little scared, but I think they're all gonna live. And they did, and they healed up. Fantastic. Alright. So we did gain more dust there. So with more dust, what we would want to do is probably uh, power up a room like this one, so we can build another module there. And also, we can build some turrets there to deal with the enemies that would come in from these sides. I don't think this room needs to be powered up in order to make our uh, crystals actually, like, research, basically. Like, if we uh, right-click on this, we should be able to come down here and see... Yeah, it's gonna take two more doors, two more turns, basically, in order to get that research. So, I hope I've done a pretty good job of explaining the kind of interlocking systems you got going on here. You got this FTL-style jumping beacon to beacon, which is represented by going from door to door. Um, the combat works the same way, the enemies, uh, like, r basically rush tower defense style towards your crystal, although they have different priorities for who they choose to attack. Your units attack them, uh, basically autonomously with their own free will. Uh, you also have a little bit of base building, a little bit of tower defense, and a little bit of RPG style stuff going on with uh, finding equipment and stuff like that. Right now, uh, to be honest with you, we've seen kind of a boring cross-section of beacons. We've seen a lot of, uh, not beacons, but rooms. Uh, we've seen a lot of, uh, rooms that just have enemies. We've seen one with a research crystal, but there are some that get a little bit, uh, more unique. Oh, there's one more door up here. Um, because we're not going to be in this region, I actually am going to invest some of our resources into making um, some prisoner prods here. Costs us like maybe two turns almost worth of industry, but if it uh, you know helps our stuff stay alive, that's okay. When we build modules, there are some enemies that will attack modules directly, and those are the worst, man. Uh, we can't build a module this turn, by the way, because we don't have enough industry. Building modules, or creators, I guess I should say, costs, um, more industry per module or creator that you build. So let's go open this door. Again, we still haven't found our exit yet. The game does a really good job of giving you, uh, scarcity and constantly forcing you to make trade-offs, basically, which I think is the, you know, the, the hook of almost any good roguelite or roguelike, um, you know, it, abundance is what kills these games. When you end up in a situation where you have, um... Oh, they are attacking the crystal, so we should get down there as soon as possible. Um... When you have too much of anything, makes the game... Oh, is our... 
Oh no, it's, it whittles down our, our crystal. Okay, that's fine. Um, when you have too much of anything, it makes the game too easy and makes it kind of boring. Dungeon of the Endless does a great job of keeping things uh, scarce, which keeps things scary, which keeps things interesting. Uh, so we did open up this room. I'm noticing that on easy versus too easy, there's just a, a crazy shortage of, of dust. Like, I, I am not able to illuminate basically any rooms. What we're going to want to do, by the way, is uh, hopefully we'll find a... We'll find our exit soon. And when we find our exits, which is not here, we did unlock the tear gas module. That's from our uh, science creator. Um, when, we, when we find the exit, we're basically going to try to chart a path. I think we'll light up. Uh, by the way, you have to light up rooms um, in a chain, basically. So I can't just go like, oh, I want to light up this room. Because we, we won't have enough power to do so. So I'll light up this room so we're a little safer up here. Um, and we can also maybe take it away. Uh, no, there's nothing to take it away from, really. Nothing I feel confident taking it away from, at least. Uh, yes. Okay. Um, I forgot what I was saying, but it does a, a really good job of... Uh, oh! When we, um, when we have to leave, we kind of like chart a course, and we choose which rooms to power up and which rooms to leave depowered. And it creates uh, some interesting kind of situations, because you, you kind of almost have like a... Uh, a pipe dream style game going on. We really need to heal these units. I never had to do this on too easy. I'm probably playing terribly, but you know, Dungeon of the Endless is a hard game. I don't think I've ever seen anybody be truly good at it. Where's our uh, enemies? Do we have enemies left? Oh, there's one crystal here. Um, so it'll make more sense once I actually find uh, the exit. But for now, uh, just just trust in what I'm saying, I guess. I'm imagining, like, this is the first floor, I'm imagining the exit has got to be coming up pretty quickly. But you can see that even on the first floor, uh, the enemies are coming pretty close to actually getting the kill. You know what? Let's, let's do some math. Next turn will be at 37 industry, which will allow us to create one more creator. So what I think we should do, maybe, is uh, build a couple more prisoner prods. And then, even still, we'll still have enough turn to generate industry on our next, or to, to build an industry creator or a food creator or something on our next turn. But uh, there's there's some serious scarcity going on here. This has got to be our exit. I think this might have been uh, the last room. No, we got one more room back here. Now, uh, dark rooms, I don't think, are guaranteed to spawn enemies. They just have a good chance to spawn enemies. We got very lucky then that none of them did here. So we'll explore the entirety of the floor. Just Oh, you know what? We should have totally researched more. I'm being kind of an idiot here. There we go. Now I've opened the last door, and I made a terrible mistake because I should not have just one unit doing that. Um, but we'll, we'll, you know what, we can't even do more research now, that was a huge mistake. I'll have her crank her speed up, which is her active ability, and then run back up here to give this guy some help, because this guy's, uh, he's weak. But, uh, he does some decent damage, and when he levels up, he can get, like, some passive scientific skills, basically. Be okay, you'll be okay, I'm sure you'll be okay. Give it a second here. All right, now comes the uh, interesting part of the game. Well, I mean, it's all interesting, but one of the more interesting phases because it's kind of discreet. We have an exit over here, and we have a limited amount of power. So let's depower all of our rooms except for the starting room here. Oh, all right. So we have uh, six rooms that we can power up, I think. What we have to do is grab the crystal. So we might as well put people in the crystal room to start with here, and we'll, we'll have... Um our dude go into the crystal room because he's a little bit less uh, he's gonna carry the crystal because he's a little bit less tanky and um, a little bit less offensively minded we need our lady around so that she can chop people up basically uh, we need to get from here to here when you're carrying the crystal you're super slow and when you're carrying the crystal enemies spawn in these dark rooms so I think that's oh man we can't even light up our exit which is gonna be such a pain in the ass um, yeah, so in order to do this, this is pretty much the best we can do. Because we can't depower our crystal room. So there's going to be enemies that spawn here. Enemies will now, for the final phase, uh, because we're going to be taking the crystal, the floor is over. Uh, we can't do anything else on the floor. They're going to spawn in all of these dark rooms. So I'm not too worried about the ones that spawn here and here, because they'll get hit by uh, the prisoner prods. But I'm very worried about the, one up, the ones up here, and I'm very worried about the ones over here. So what I think I'm going to do is uh, invest in some prisoner prods here. 
The problem is you don't necessarily want to spend a ton of uh, industry on this stuff because you take it down to the next floor and then that could give you a head start or put you very much behind the eight ball. But let's try this now. Okay, so we're going to have him pick up the crystal. As soon as he picks it up, all the enemies are going to start coming for us. We're going to tell him to, you know, get the hell out of dodge here and then we're, we're going to have our uh, escort here try to do a better job at... Uh, protecting him. Now we can maybe farm these guys for some dust, but I would rather, like, it, it's all about survival at this point. It's like an FTL, uh, you know, a, a covert mission. You pretty much just want to get the hell out as quickly as you can. Um, but it's not really plausible to get out quickly. So you pretty much, you know, you know you're gonna have some losses somewhere along the lines. This is actually going pretty well so far. Um, any enemies that follow us in should get ruined by those prisoner prods. Ah, but luckily, there were no enemies that spawned in here, or they spawned in here and already got killed, so we can just exit and we made it out safely. I would say that first floor went relatively well. For me. So it took us 14 minutes, um, we killed 74 monsters, and these are the resources that we're taking down to the next level. Let's do another floor here. There are some extra, like, there's story stuff and dialogue that happens between the characters. I don't think it's that, uh, you know, pressing. I just mostly like the game from a mechanic standpoint, but it's really, really addictive. And I spent a lot of time just kind of uh, doing exposition and talking about the actual mechanics of the game and how it works. But uh, let's talk a little bit about how it feels. It, it feels like it's got that same kind of addictive, hooky, one more turn nature as, uh, as Civ does. And as FTL does. It, it's not necessarily a 4X game, nor is it necessarily un FTL like. Although I will say, you know, of, of all the rogue light games, the one it's most similar to probably is FTL. Um, but it's uh, it's extremely interesting, extremely addictive. How long does the average run take? It's long. Um, I played on very easy. I got halfway through a run, and it took me about 90 minutes. So, uh, on easy, if you're taking your time, note that I play these games a little bit faster than most people, which is not to say that I'm better, I just am more comfortable making mistakes, I guess, um, and, and, you know, it allow myself that possibility and, and, and lazy and impatient and impulsive, um, but Kate told me that, you know, getting to floor 11, floor 12 could take you five hours on a run, so, uh, this is definitely not the kind of thing that I would describe as necessarily a lunch break roguelike. Um, which is a, a semi-popular term, I guess, for uh, games like this that have come out recently. Uh, it's it's not necessarily super long, each run, that is. Um, but uh, it's definitely the kind of thing where you're, you're going to want to maybe like take breaks in the middle of it. Which, to be honest with you, I do hold against the game a little bit. Because I, I tend to prefer games like Spelunky or Isaac where um, you can, you know, jump in, jump out, and get a run done, you know, in 45 minutes or something like that. That being said... Uh, it's, it's addictive enough that I don't hold it against it too much because it's been so much fun playing it to begin with. We can level this guy up. So he gets an active skill, which is verbal abuse. Basically gives uh, our heroes that are in the room with him a little bit of a buff. It does have a little bit of a learning curve, but considering the amount of uh, kind of intersecting systems that are going on, it's actually not that bad. Like within half an hour, I found myself being like, okay, so you you know, you, you kind of get a turn order down. You open your first door, uh, you build an industry generator, and then you say, okay, what's gonna come next? Do I want science or food? Well, I look at this and I say, you know, we don't have very much uh, food right now. We have a decent amount of science. Why don't we build a food replicator on our next turn? And then it, once you learn how like dust works and stuff like that, it becomes pretty easy. It, it's different than any other game, but I don't think it's or inaccessible. Okay, so here's some other kind of cool rooms that we can find. Sometimes we just find equipment. So on this one we found photon decelerator. So if we look at our backpack, we can look at it. Speed 2, unlock scamper. Let's put this in the device slot for her. She gets scamper. The monsters don't slow the hero. Alright, so that's not a very great piece of equipment. But it's interesting that there is a room like that that just has a chest in it. And there's other rooms that kind of give us more FTLE style stuff like, you know, a decision, for example. I have never seen this monster. That scares the crap out of me. Let's use our active skill. Uh, it, it gets a cooldown of a few turns and then is fine. But, um, uh, what was I going to say? Oh, yeah, sometimes we'll f come across a room and it'll be like, there's an artifact. Do you want to pay 20 industry to, to open the artifact or to use the artifact? And if you do, sometimes it'll give you a huge bounty of dust or a huge bounty of food or something like that. And sometimes it'll explode and do damage to you and you won't get your industry back. Uh, also, you can have you can uh, grow your squad just by finding squad members kind of in the dungeons. Now, I wouldn't expect that to happen on our first or second floor here necessarily. Um, but you do grow kind of a diverse party as you go by uh, basically hiring uh, squad members with food. And you can get squad members with cool skills. Sometimes they'll just unlock as you level up on the characters we already have. Like on level... Four or five or something. One of these characters might get 
I, I forget the name of the skill, but basically if you leave them in a room with the module, they make it 50% more effective. So instead of generating, you know, seven food per turn, we might generate 10 as a result of, you know, enhancing basically this module. The problem is, then you don't have that unit available to, uh, to help attacking. So if you have, like, one really powerful attacking unit, maybe that's a viable strategy. Otherwise, you might not be able to afford it. Similarly, um... Oh, did we find... we found something here. Military specialist bracelets. Okay. I don't know, um... How this will work for us, but we'll try it out. I haven't seen uh, this item yet. And we can find weapons and stuff as well. Like, for example, uh, in my... In my last run, I had, uh... A lightsaber that I gave to our... Hero here, and she didn't really... Gain, like, a visual effect from using it, it looked like, but still, it gave her better stats. Defense 3, attack power 4, intended as ornaments, these gaudy kitschy bracers are essentially indestructible. So that seems better than Photon Decelerator, but we'll go back to our other hero here and put Photon Decelerator on him. Every unit, or many units, do use different kinds of equipment, by the way, in case that wasn't abundantly clear. But yeah, it's, it's addictive. One floor probably takes you around, uh... Maybe 15 to 30 minutes, and I think if you broke that into, you know, oh, there's our exit, so we could leave right away. Uh, we probably don't want to, though. I mean, that's another balance, right? It's like Spelunky. Just because you found the exit doesn't mean you necessarily want to leave. Uh, maybe you want to um, play longer. We're going to build a prisoner prod here, by the way, because we can afford to and still get another creator built next turn. But, um, you know, maybe you want to leave right away if the floor seems too dangerous, but if it's not dangerous, you could get more industry, you could get more science, um, and... Uh, you, you can make your life a, a little bit easier for the next floor because you do carry those resources down with you. So we found basically like a temporary buff. Heroes on the floor get defense times zero, uh, excuse me, but they get speed plus 30%. Heroes in the room without monsters give an attack power bonus to offensive modules based on their wit. Look, I don't necessarily know what uh, all those fancy words mean, but it doesn't really matter because the game... Uh, I, I was going to say plays itself, but that's not really what I mean. But you don't need to have, like, an intimate knowledge of the deeper mechanics to totally understand, uh, you know, what to do on X turn, if that makes sense. So, uh, we've got another industry generator here going. I think we'll go until we finish this floor, just to give you a little bit better of an idea how the game progresses. Because the first floor was a little tricky, but honestly, was not anything in comparison to the floors that we're going to face a little bit later. And now we're seeing some cooler rooms as well. So, this is our research crystal. We find one or more uh, on every floor. We'll generate an emergency generator here, which will take like three or four turns to actually um, get researched. But once it's researched, it allows us to power up a room without actually using uh, our precious dust. Now, it's very expensive from an industry standpoint, but it saves us dust. And dust is a little bit more of a limited resource. So uh, I think it's, it's an important tool sometimes. Additionally, uh, research unlocks new kinds of uh, towers that we can basically use for our tower defense purposes. Um, you know, we we unlock... I don't think this wave is over yet, is it? Maybe it is. You can usually tell if you can, like, uh... We're gonna need to build some prisoner prods down here. Um, well, yeah, here you can see that we can unlock, like, new tiers for our, uh, items. Like, when it says tier gas 1, you can research tier gas 2, 3, etc, etc. Same with prisoner prod. Uh, but also, like, you can get support towers and uh, defensive towers and stuff like that. Applies of damage of 4 per second to monsters in the same room. So let's build, like, one of these, and then we can build... How much was that? Seven. Wow. And then we'll build uh, one prisoner prod as well, because we know that enemies are probably going to spawn here. In fact, we might want to... Um, we have one there. We might want to, like, depower this room and kind of funnel enemies through here to power up this room so our crystal's a little safer. Yes, I think this is acceptable. But uh, we're going to have to, you know issue orders to our units here. That's the thing, you've got too many things that need to be done at the same time. Um, it makes it it makes it difficult to do. Yeah, see, we're gonna have enemies coming down from here. Let's uh, send our units down here. So I've been playing, uh, at this point, this video has been a long video here. Um, I, I've probably played about two hours of Dungeon of the Endless so far, and I, I wanted to highlight it because I'm, I'm worried that this game is great, but is gonna be completely overlooked because Rebirth came out. And this is not me taking an anti- Oh, jeez, our unit almost died there. This is not me taking an anti-Rebirth standpoint by any stretch of the imagination. Um, I'm just saying, you know, there's room for, for multiple games to kind of exist. Uh, we, even within the same sphere, sphere coming out uh, fairly closely to one another. Oh, man, we're gonna have to use so much food to heal this unit. Um, and this game, it would be a real pity if uh, if it was 
so overlooked. I'm not saying it's going to be everyone's cup of tea, because it is a little bit more strategy-focused than necessarily roguelike-ish, uh, but it's it's really, really cool, and uh, it's the favorite for me of all the endless games that have come out. And I know that these games have been getting a little bit of a cult following. I hesitate to say cult following because it makes it seem like it's kind of small, but really they've... Uh, I'm not going to say exploded in popularity or anything like that, but they have, uh, you know, the Endless Legend in particular and Endless Space, they have a, a pretty big following. Uh, but uh, I, w I would recommend checking out Dungeon of the Endless, you know, it's it's relatively not cost prohibitive for the kind of, you know, substantial gameplay you're getting here. And I think it's the kind of game that you could spend maybe even hundreds of hours in, although it's kind of irresponsible of me to suggest that. Uh, considering that this is, uh, you know, still relatively early first impressions. But as of right now, I'm liking the game a whole hell of a lot. Let's put it that way. Okay, we're gonna try to stop him from getting to the tower here. Oh! You can come back here, please. I will say it's kind of a shame that over the course of this, uh, this episode, or this video, not to necessarily foreshadow anything, but over the course of this episode, we haven't seen any new, uh, heroes kind of pop up, because that's kind of a cool element of the game. Um, which is, uh, unfortunately not fully on display here. Did we- oh, we finished our research, so we should get more. Oh no, we're already researching emergency generator. Was there a second crystal or something that I missed? Oh, there is a second crystal up here, yeah. Um, we're having a little bit of trouble here. We already started researching on that one. Um, we're having a little bit of trouble here because dust is so scarce. I really can't stress enough that after playing on, uh, very easy, easy is is quite challenging actually this is only sector two you might be saying oh this looks pretty easy well yeah on uh freaking sector two of ftl you're probably not going to be in that hard of a hard up uh, situation either it's really only uh you know once you get into the mid game at least after you get a little you know certain base familiarity with stuff it's only once you get into the mid game that things get truly uh difficult okay let's uh use our buff here because we are going to have to deal with a lot of enemies probably attacking our um our crystal here I've never actually had the crystal break, but I do know that if you're carrying that crystal, like that escort mission style stuff that happens at the end, if you're carrying the crystal and uh, you drop it or your character that has it dies, then you instantly, oh jeez, you instantly lose um, because your crystal just gets broken. Oh, this isn't over yet? We're going to have to heal a little bit more. Um, I hate uh, spending food on healing our units because we could use, use it to level them up instead, and they already heal all the way. Um, once a turn ends, or once a phase ends, so I just spent like six turns worth of food here. Did I need to? Maybe, maybe not, right? Um, I think this is not going so fantastically. So I may want to consider, uh, just running to the exit. This also provides us with a convenient way to end, uh, the video, maybe. So I'm gonna try to light up. Now, here's the thing, we have so little dust, we can't even light up, like, almost any of the path that would actually take us through to the, the crystal. Well, let's try it anyway. So, we'll have uh, this unit grab the crystal, and then start running for this exit. Uh, and we'll have our lady friend come into this room, and uh, she should be able to just kind of hang out here and hopefully stop some of these enemies. We did unlock our, our new uh, prisoner prod, which is good for the future, I guess. Where's my crystal man? Oh, there he is. I think we're going to be able to make it to the exit. We might have to heal her a little bit. Yeah, you can leave without everybody being there. I think that's a bad idea, though. There we go. So we got to the exit. You know, I don't think we've set ourselves up fantastically for the future. But hey, we did uh, manage to complete that. Not an enormous problem. That's going to do it for my Let's Look Out of Dungeon of the Endless, but uh, I may do a mini-series on this game because I'm having so much fun with it. It's it's a really uh, unique game. It's got a lot of interlocking systems that pull from genres I'm a big fan of, and uh, above all else, keep an eye on this. You know, I'm not necessarily saying it's a must-buy right now or anything like that, especially if you're investing 500 hours this month into another roguelike that shall not be named. Uh, but be aware of this. If this goes on sale or, you know, you uh, find yourself thinking, hmm, I could really go for a game with these kind of strategic elements, uh, but a little bit maybe more of a compressed play than uh, than a 4X game or something like that. Um, not not to compare this to a 4X game, because I know people are going to be like, this is nothing like Civ. I, I know, but it's got some like light base building elements. Um, and resource gain and stuff like that. But yeah, if you find yourself intrigued by it, uh, be aware of it. I think it's definitely worth the, the $13 Canadian asking price, probably, again, $12 American, $12.50, I'm not totally sure. Uh, our dollar is pretty weak right now. Uh, but especially, like, if you can get this on sale, this is the kind of game that uh, could end up being one of those value purchases where 
you're like, you know, in a Reddit thread two years from now, you're like, I put 200 hours in a Dungeon of the Endless, I picked it up on sale for, you know, 750 or something like that. Uh, as is, great game, I didn't even talk about it, the soundtrack is so fucking good. Really reminiscent of FTL, kind of like ambient, you know, Brian Eno, Aphex Twin style stuff. It, it's a, like, audio-visual standpoint, really, really, uh, immersive game to play. I'm having a great time with it so far, and I'm probably going to play more of it, maybe on the channel. But for now, thanks for watching. I hope you guys enjoyed the episode. If you did, click the like button. It helps out a great deal. And, of course, subscribe if you want to see more in the future. But for now, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.